right. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight for our September virtual town hall. In a moment, I will turn things over to our moderators, Good Government Illinois' David Orr and Reform for Illinois' Elisa Kaplan to introduce tonight's panelists, former Cook County Board of Ethics member, Juliet Sorensen, Blacks and Greens' Naomi Davis, and the University of Chicago Center for Municipal Finance's Chris Berry. But first, a couple of quick housekeeping items. We are live streaming on Facebook right now. So if you're joining by Zoom and you don't want your image to be shown on our Facebook broadcast, you can go ahead and turn off your uh, camera. To do that, you can click the video camera icon at the bottom right of your screen. Everyone's microphones are gonna be muted tonight to prevent background noise. If you have a question for our panel, please type it into the chat box and we will ask as many as we can in the time that we have available tonight. And finally, Events like these are only possible with your support. Please visit www.goodgovernmentillinois.com to chip in so that we can keep holding virtual town halls and hopefully soon have some in-person events as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to Reform for Illinois' Elisa Kaplan. Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be here and to be here with David uh, and all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Elisa Kaplan and I'm the Executive Director of Reform for Illinois. Reform for Illinois was founded in 1997 by Senator Paul Simon and Lieutenant Governor Paul Kustra. We are a nonpartisan organization dedicated to advocating for reforms that create a more accountable, ethical, and equitable government in Illinois. Our focus on that intersection between ethics and equity is what brings us here today. We're gonna to talk about property taxes in Cook County. It's a time-honored tradition to complain about how high property taxes are in Illinois, and we're gonna do a little bit of that, but that's only a very small part of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about how the property tax burden is distributed here and whether it's fair and equitable, and if not, why? This is an issue with serious consequences for everyone who lives or does business in Cook County, especially for communities of color and our most vulnerable residents. We'll talk about the practices of former Cook County Assessor Joe Barrios and their ongoing impact today, and about recent allegations involving the Cook County Board of Review, one of the agencies that hears appeals to decisions about property assessment. We're gonna ask what's changed since Barrios left office and what the new assessor, Fritz Kage, is doing differently and what the road ahead looks like. Finally, we're gonna talk about what we can all do to try and fix some of these problems and create a fairer property tax system that benefits us all. This is an incredibly important topic that affects the life and livelihood of every Illinoisan. I'm grateful to our guests for taking the time to be here and helping us understand this complicated topic and what we can do about it. And now it's my honor to introduce David Orr, former Cook County Clerk, Head of Good Government Illinois, and most importantly, board member of Reform for Illinois to introduce our panel. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you, Alicia. I'm also very pleased to be working and collaborating with, with Reform for Illinois. Uh, this is a vast, vast topic we're taking on. And as you'll see tonight, we plan to have a three-part series because there's so much to discuss relating to assessments and how we improve uh, the inequities in the system. Um, so briefly, I think most of you know, but Cook County, um, another small organization, we try and shed light on best practices and in some case, worst practices, what governments could be doing to improve efficiency, et cetera. We also are very concerned about protecting our democracy and the vote. And of course, we want to uh, educate, mentor, whatever, encouraging good people to run for office. Uh, so like I mentioned, we're gonna have a three point ser uh, series. We may not get to all of your questions because there's quite a few of them, we will try and get as many as we can. And many of you have asked similar questions. So I, I think that uh, you'll be taken care of. So let me get right to introductions of our guests so we can get to questions. Okay, let me start with uh, Juliet Sorensen, who was returning, uh, Juliet was on a show last year, uh, professor of law, but also associated with the Center for International Human Rights. Uh, she's the director of Northwestern's Access to Health Project and the executive director of Injustice Watch, known for exposing institutional failures that obstruct justice, 
uh, and equality. Back between 2003 and 2010, she was the assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago, focusing on fraud and public corruption. Must have been pretty busy. Um, <laughs> she's also um, a reform member, or was, of the uh, Chicago Board of Ethics, and hopefully we'll get into that a little later. Uh, she was an, involved in a, a, a strong, good ethics ordinance uh, that has been stalled now for quite a while. Okay, next, um, we have Naomi Davis. Naomi, again, welcome. Naomi is the president of BIG, that stands for Blacks in Green, a nonprofit focusing on harnessing the new green economy. She's an attorney, an activist, and a proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers. From BIG's headquarters, called the Green Living Room in the Woodlawn community, she seeks to replicate that and other issues. She's quite a teacher in uh, Black communities, particularly all across America. As an advocate for equitable community development, Naomi testified on the impact of inequitable property tax burdens on black and brown communities. So welcome, Naomi. And finally, we have Mr. Chris Berry, who as said before, a professor um, at the University of Chicago and the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, he also is the academic director for the Center for Municipal Finance widely published his book on the imperfect union representation and taxation in multi-level uh, governments won the best book award in urban politics before coming to chicago uh, he, he did a, he was a post uh, doctoral fellow at harvard uh, active in many community issues but particularly community development and was director of an organization called metro edge division uh, of Shore Bank, and those of you who don't remember, Shore Bank was America's oldest and largest community development financial institution. All of them have many, many honors and wonderful things to say about them because of time, we're gonna keep them short. So w welcome all of you, and we're gonna start the question with you, Elisa. Chris, we're gonna start with you. You've been studying this topic for a long time. You've written about it a lot. What can you tell us about your key findings about this and other analyses about our property tax system in Cook County, like the Chicago Tribune and ProPublica reports that came out a few years ago? Sure, thanks. Thanks for having me tonight. Nice to see you all here. The Cook County property taxes is, is, uh, is quite, a, quite a topic. And I just wanna start with, since we're gonna be talking about assessments and assessors, what they should be doing, and then we'll get into what, what have they be do, been doing and, and have they been doing it right. You know, the assessor doesn't set your taxes, but determines the value of your property. This is a really important step because the property tax is meant to be a tax that's proportional to the value of your property. So if my house is worth twice as much as yours, I should pay twice as much in property taxes as you do. The assessor determines that value because it, if your home hasn't sold recently, we don't really know what it's worth. We need somebody to estimate and figure it out. And that's where the assessor comes in and their role in government. Unfortunately, for a very long time in Cook County, assessors haven't been doing this job especially well. And with respect to Joe Berrios and the findings of the ProPublica uh, uh, reports, the Tribune reports, and my own research, there were really two major problems under the Berrios administration. First was inequities in the way they assessed residential properties. So effectively, they were underassessing the most valuable properties in the county and overassessing the least valuable properties. These, because the value of your property is the basis on which your tax is determined, if they've underestimated what your home is worth, you're gonna end up underpaying your taxes. And so effectively what's happening under Berrios and truth be told, most assessors prior to him as well, is that the people that own the most valuable property in the county homes are paying less as a tax rate than people who own less valuable homes. So, and that's referred to as regressivity. By my estimates under Berrios alone, something on the order of about $1 billion in taxes was shifted from the top 10% of homeowners in the county onto everybody else, disproportionately those at the bottom. This is an important feature of the property tax is that when one person pays too little, that amount has to be made up somewhere else. The levy is fixed. The government's gonna get a fixed amount of dollars out of the tax base. And so if one person pays too little, everybody else is gonna end up paying too much. So the first problem under Berrios is within residential property, taxing the people that own the least valuable homes too much and the most valuable homes too little. 
The second problem under Berrios, which is not from my own research, but from the Tribune and ProPublica research, is that the Berrios administration was systematically undervaluing commercial property. So remember that the tax base is composed of, of various types of property. Residential property is the type that concerns most of us as individual homeowners, but a very large chunk of our property tax base comes in Chicago from commercial property. And what the tribute analysis showed is that Berrios was undervaluing commercial properties, in some cases quite dramatically. They had a, an example of, a, of the uh, Sears Tower, the Willis Tower, whatever it's called these days, uh, which was valued at essentially half of what it sold for. Uh, and this is a pretty widespread inequity. And again, back to the point I was making before, if one property is paying too little, the others are paying too much. And so by undervaluing commercial properties, they're effectively shifting that tax burden onto residential properties. And those were the two major problems under, under the Barrios administration. And as I said, is probably under most prior administrations too. Do you have a sense, Chris, of why this was happening? Well, I think there's a few, a few, uh, you know, uh, two broad categories of reasons. So, so one is it, it, assessing is actually a hard job, and I, I do want to acknowledge that. And so, some of the problems with assessing um, residential property are very deep, and, and we, we see this kind of inequity in lots of jurisdictions. It's not just in Cook County. Um, and part of the problem is if the, if your home has some features that the assessor cannot see, maybe you have a beautiful new kitchen and your neighbor doesn't. Uh, then you're going to be underassessed because you've got this, this great um, asset that the buyer, prospective buyer can see, but the assessor doesn't see. So just data problems, modeling problems, assessing is a hard job, and that was part of it. But I think what other folks really believe was going on is, A, they, they were not doing state-of-the-art work. So under the various administration, they were using very, uh, let's just say, low-quality assessing models. Their techniques, their data, their statistics were, were not good. Um, and of course, at the same time, uh, there were lots of accusations of, of corruption, particularly as respect uh, in respect to the assessment of commercial property. Uh, influential people, you know, I mean, it's no, it's no secret that Mike Madigan runs uh, a major uh, law firm whose business is appealing commercial property taxes, and so did Ed Burke. And so I think it's a combination of, of ineptitude, bad practice, um, and, and no small amount of actual corruption. Naomi, can I bring you in a bit here? Can you talk about, you've testified about the equity impacts of these kinds of inequitable assessments on, on communities. Can you talk a little bit about that and the consequences of this and, you know, in the real world and um, about steps you took to, uh, to change it? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, we, uh, first of all, um, acknowledge the the depth of the research that's been done. I read with deep interest years ago, uh, the very uh, long form research that published and have had many conversations with, uh, with uh, the assessor's office and with my neighbors uh, over the last four years. In this regard, it is clear uh, from the research that between you know, 300 and $350 million a year, a year is uh, improperly extracted from uh, black and brown or lower income communities. Um, the, uh, by virtue of the um, uh, under assessment of some properties and over and corresponding over assessment of others. We understand um, this data very well, but we don't necessarily link that to the loss of property um, we don't necessarily link that to the, um, the unaffordability uh, coming into a property when we, we're not necessarily linking it to the corresponding under uh, appraisal of a property. So how you are over assessed while currently, while simultaneously being uh, under appraised means that the, the, that same house that ought to be a tool for wealth building as it is for many um, households across Chicago in uh, the average uh, black or brown community is, is appraised at 40% less than um, a similar property owned uh, in, a, in a white community. So when you add that to the fact that you're not gonna be able to go to your bank 
And then you have, um, then you have the banks, which are um, a continuing practices of uh, discriminatory uh, lending that, uh, that a white uh, client and a black client can go into the bank with all the same financials, everything apples to apples, and uh, the, the black client be declined the loan, the white client being granted the loan. So less value in your home, less ability to, to borrow from it, and, and at the same time, um, a higher tax base. Uh, these are the kinds of, this is, a, this is a tsunami, a perfect storm of extraction that black communities um, suffer uh, quietly uh, over decades while, uh, while, uh, while having to um, work multiple jobs at lower income um, to be able to afford their households. These well-documented um, perpetrations um, need to be addressed with a reparation and yet we're, not, we're never getting to that part of the conversation. We're always content to uh, have pristine data about the injustice, but where is the action? So what we're saying here is that um, any, any person who understands the process of appealing in a, in a tax scenario they understand that they must submit financials. They must submit data about uh, the, the, the structure, um, about, the, um, uh, about the improvements um, so that a proper assessment of uh, the, the value can, can be understood um, in the appeals process. And so what the bill has been saying is you're going to submit this documentation anyway, submit it in advance so that the uh, assessments can be equalized. Um, everybody believes in a fair tax until it means that they will pay more. Everybody believes in, qual in equality until their white privilege has got to be questioned and equalized. And if you want to talk about how to um, implement equity in real terms. Dollars and cents is a very fine way to assess it. And so we're looking at together how we're going to stop the practice of extraction and how we're going to go back and fix the damage. Some damage will never be repaired. People lose homes, communities are fragmented, families are scattered. Um, uh, family properties are, uh, you know, are, are, are diminished. We, we understand um, that change is absolutely mandated in this, in the in context of cheating, corruption, and actual race hate. Naomi, thank you. You mentioned that, um, you mentioned some legislation that would require some, some changes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and, and your, your testimony about that? What would the law do? What was it trying to fix? Well, as essentially, um, it's, it's a process of, of understanding uh, with documentation in advance what, um, what the real truest value of the property is. If we understand uh, in any basic real estate transaction, um, the sale of a property is going to be based on comparables. Um, those comparables are established based in a uh, market pace, marketplace with real dollars and cents. Um, it's not a mystery um, what the value of a property is. And so what the legislation is, is essentially um, requiring is that rather than as, 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 um, as part of an appeals process that documentation um, be submitted, that it be submitted uh, at the time 
that assessment is is going to be happening so that we are we're all we're level setting essentially and while uh, we we understand there's resistance to the idea of providing this data about property rental income etc um, there it's the same industry data that any lending institution will ask for that any realtor is going to ask for it's standard basic information. And why should you be able to hide that information um, to the detriment of others? If you understand that the net impact of this practice is an extractive, unfair, um, the perpetuation of an unfair system, why are you insisting upon continuing that practice? Thank you, Naomi. I'm, I'm going to um, bring this back to Chris for a minute to talk about you. Naomi, you were talking about this proposed legislation that was supported by the current assessor, Fritz Kagey, that would improve disclosure of um, certain data that would help create a fairer assessment model. Chris, can you talk about some of the other changes that the new assessor since 2018 has put into place, um, how those might compare to the to, the for, to his predecessor and how they might compare it to national best practices. Sure, uh, first, uh, just one point uh, regarding the legislation that uh, Naomi is re referring to is that this pertains to commercial properties. I just want, want to make this distinction that, uh, you know, in, you know when, when, when we're talking about a residential property, a home, it's, it's relatively easier to value them because we can look at other similar homes that have sold and use statistical models of various kinds to, to estimate their value. Commercial property is much harder to value, particularly some of the more unusual properties, say I already referred to the Willis Tower. You know, there's not another half dozen Willis Towers that sold in, you know, recently that we can use to estimate the value uh, of the real one. And so that makes the, the task for commercial harder. And without going into details about how it's done, it's just, it's just a, different, a different methodology altogether. And one of the things that will make that work much easier is if the assessor has access to basic information, such as, you know, what is the income uh, that the owner of the building is deriving from, from, from tenants and, and things like that. And, and the bill is just designed to, to get them to, to disclose that information, give it to the assessor, uh, which then the assessor could use to, to produce better values. Um, so, but more generally, your question is, what is what is new, the new assessor doing? So, you know, as a result of, of the reporting by the Tribune and ProPublica and, and other such things, we, we have a new assessor, assessor who campaigned on reforming the system and fixing the problems that I, that I refer to. I think it's still too early to say whether he's been successful uh, because the results are not, are not uh, fully in yet. Uh, I don't think, you know, they, they reassessed the, the northern part of the uh, part of the county, but that wasn't really the, the problematic part. We have data from the northern part and the, and the assessments are, are good, but they weren't especially bad there to begin with. What we're really gonna need to see to know if, if Kegi has been successful in his reforms is the assessments in the city. Uh, those bills are going out, but the data haven't been released yet. And my, my understanding is they'll be re releasing that in January. And then those of us you know, who study this can really dig in and, and we'll see the results and, and the success. But what I can say is in terms of process, and again, not results, but process, it's night and day that they've, they've changed um, pretty much everything about how the office operates, starting with transparency. I mean, now, if you wanna know how they value your home, uh, they put their statistical code online. Uh, they put their data online. They're very transparent about what they're doing. And I've looked at the models and what they're doing. And it is, you know, I, I referred earlier to the Barris administration using very primitive and, and, and not uh, state-of-the-art statistical approaches. This has completely changed under, under Kagi. They have very sophisticated models, very cutting edge. And you asked about best practices. I would say Cook County has gone from being really a national embarrassment in the area of assessment to being a, you know, a real leader. I was just speaking uh, last week at the International Association of Assessing Officers and talked to many uh, folks there from around the country who were lauding the work that's been done here in Cook County under Kegi. Now, that's all thus far about process. They've improved the process. They've improved lots of aspects of how they operate. We'll see, I think, soon enough, how that's translated into better outcomes. Have you seen changes in, in the two issues that you mentioned earlier in the re regressive assessment of residential properties 
and the shift from commercial properties onto residential properties? Yeah, so uh, with respect to the first, the inequitable assessment across different uh, values of residential property, no, we haven't really seen the result on that yet. As I said, they've only done the North try, and that really wasn't where the big problems were. The city is where the big problems were. We will see that when these data come out in January. I know they have tried to fix it. We'll see if they have. With respect to commercial, we are already seeing him start to fix that because we're seeing values of commercial properties going up. Uh, and the, the, the assessed values of the commercial properties are, are going up. So I think it's pretty clear that they're beginning to rectify that issue. And the owners of those properties, of course, are, are, are unhappy about it. And I understand why. Um, but we can already see from the assessments that were done in the North Try that they're raising commercial assessments more than residential. That's exactly what would be needed to fix this problem of undervaluing commercial relative to residential. So I think it's pretty clear uh, that they're moving in the right direction on that. Again, the really major action is going to be in the city, and we'll see those results relatively soon. Thank you, Chris. Do you want to share that? Well, let's just um, one more one more thing on this, Chris, because uh, one of our, our listeners, uh, Betty Magnus, uh, had, had asked. She recently saw a huge increase in her recent tax bill, even with her senior exemption. Is that because quote they've been too low all along, and now they're making up for it? And that's a question a lot of people have, and without going too big into the weeds, because uh, people can, their assessments can rise significantly. It may not affect their tax bill much at all. Other people, particularly in poor communities where they have very little commercial, there's a much greater burden, particularly in poor neighborhoods on yeah. the homeowners, even where their property values have gone down. Uh, yeah. I know it's complicated, but what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I say two things. Uh, the first, and it's important, as you said, for people to understand that their their tax bill can go up for a lot of reasons without their assessments changing. So it is at the same time that we have a new assessor and Keggy's making these reforms, there have been increases in the levy, you know? And so those increases are gonna result in your taxes going up <laughs> kind of no matter what. Um, so it's important when you, when you look at, at your tax bill to see where the increase is coming from. Is it because they've changed the value of your home or because the actual levy has gone up and the levies are going up? So, so people should just be aware of that. Your taxes are going up even if your values aren't changing. And that's just because the, and if you're unhappy about that, that's, that's got to do with the schools and, and, and the city and the county raising their levies. Um, however, it could be that your assessed value has, has gone up. And if you own a home that has been historically undervalued, so a, probably a more expensive than average home, uh, there's a pretty good chance that your assessed value is going to go up because they're correcting those historical underassessments. I can tell you, I own a home whose valuation went up pretty considerably and my taxes went up pretty considerably. Nobody likes paying taxes, in, including me. Um, but the, what I always say to people who ask me this very question, because I hear it a lot, is if you look at that new value and you know, you know what your home is worth, is the new value more accurate or less accurate? And in my case, and most of the people I talk to, if they're being honest, that new value is more accurate. Now, if that's not true for you, if you are actually in a situation where they've raised your value beyond what your home is worth, and so as Naomi said, you can appeal, there's, you know, there's, there's recourse you have, but people need to be honest with themselves. When they see their assessed value go up, is that new value actually a bit closer to what your home's really worth? Okay, uh, we're gonna uh, bring Juliet in. Uh, sorry, we haven't heard from you yet, but you'll, are you there, I hope? I just don't see her on the screen. Yes, yes, I'm here. There you are. Okay, good. Um, okay, so we've been talking a lot about the uh, assessor's office. Now, as many of you know, and again, we don't have time to go over the detail, is that there's other places in this complicated process that you can appeal your taxes, okay? And that another place in Cook County is called the Board of Review, another office people don't know a whole lot about, okay? So as we're trying to connect the dots between property taxes, assessments, um, corruption, ethics, and so forth, um, let's get into what we're hearing about the board review. The board review is basically three commissioners elected by the public and uh, districts throughout Cook County. Um, but recently, we've had an FBI leaked investigation of someone allegedly uh, taking bribes to fix assessments. Um, we know that the IG, the Inspector General, and the Board of Ethics that you served on uh, for several years have been raising serious questions about mismanagement 
political interference and all sorts of things. Um, can you just start us off on how serious are some of these things and how much can you tell us? Some of it perhaps is confidential, but what can you tell us? Sure. Well, first, thank you so much, David and Elisa, for having me here tonight. It's always a pleasure to speak with your organizations, and I really commend you for the good work that you both are doing. It's also a pleasure to be here with Naomi and Chris, because and really what I'm about to say is going to, to echo and reinforce their earlier remarks. The answer to your question, Dave, David, how serious is the situation? It's very serious because it is systemic. And it is, it is indeed, it is a perfect storm of reinforcing inequities, as Naomi spoke about, and self-dealing by people who have the power to do so. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, the Board of Ethics and the Cook County Ethics Ordinance seeks to apply campaign finance limits. Uh, to uh, all elected officials in Cook County. And those limits uh, in terms of campaign contributions are stricter, they are capped. It's a pretty low cap at $750 for anyone who has a pending matter before that individual who is seeking election. Uh, that might include the assessor at some point in time. It might include, include members of the Board of Review at some point in time. Historically and uh, inefficiently, the Board of Ethics and the Office of Ethics uh, within Cook County had to work over time with its audit functioning, audit function, examining campaign donations uh, by individuals who, uh, who did indeed have pending matters before individuals seeking election or re-election incumbents um, at the Board of Review, and yes, also with Assessor Berrios, the previous assessor, uh, and yet they donated far in excess of that cap. Now that cap exists for good reason, of course. Uh, if you're seeking favorable review of a property tax appeal, you have an interest in currying favor with the elected official who stands to make a decision about that particular uh, property tax assessment. Uh, so the campaign finance limits exist to prevent uh, interests being made that are not being made in the best interest of the body politic, but rather in the best interest of the individual property owner. I'll add one more layer to, um, to the, uh, the tango here, which the Tribune and ProPublica appropriately called out in their series. The additional layer is property tax lawyers. They too, not only their clients, but the lawyers themselves uh, uh, seek to build relationships, ultimately to get favorable rulings from people involved in assessing and valuing their properties. That includes property tax lawyers appealing before the, before the Board of Review and the assessor. How is this inequitable? Well, if you're a savvy Cook Countyan with the means to hire a property tax lawyer and you know how this game is played, you get your property taxes knocked down every time they're assessed. That results in that systemic undervaluation that Chris Berry described. But if you don't have the means to retain one of those connected property tax lawyers, you're not going to get your taxes reduced. And over time, your property becomes overvalued. Also, given the complications with, the pro with, with valuing properties in the first place that Chris also spoke to. So it, it, it is, as I said, frankly, a pernicious tangle which involves both systemic inequities and yes, historic segregation and racism, and also the corruption and self-dealing that for too long has been a hallmark here in Cook County. Okay, let me, um, we had several questions relating to property tax attorneys, okay? And just for the record, people have a right to be lawyers. I, I hope none of us are questioning the right to represent people. Um, but there's other issues involved here. So some of those, I think, Mark uh, Fasse, I can't pronounce your name, Mark, but uh, how many millions do they make? Um, uh, Mary Banks asks, what role or payoff um, 
did they get the ones who send you letters all the time referring to some property tax folks? Uh, Susan um, Shine, if I'm pronouncing right, uh, Domano, um, been appealing for years and only real, realized recently that she didn't have to have a lawyer and why didn't she know it sooner? Could have helped a lot of people. Um, a, um, I can't read this one, but um, Crothendall, pardon me for butchering these names. Okay, but she asks about how more accurate assessments, um, if we had more accurate, accurate assessments, maybe we'd need lawyers as much. So pardon that kind of beating up of lawyers. Um, the, the question, let me make sure I understand it. Um, without going too much into the weeds, because um, it relates to the board review, Berrios, as assessor, took all this money, and the Board of Ethics said you're breaking the law. He ignored them. The county commissioners pretty much ignored him. He did what he wanted. Uh, I believe Board of Ethics took him to court. Is Actually, that he sued us before we could sue him. Oh, he sued you. He sued, oh, yeah, that's right. he sued you basically saying he's not covered by the law. The bottom yes, line that's is exactly right. um, a long court battle concluded that yes, the assessor's office is covered by the law. And if I understand right, he had to pay back $100,000, blah, blah, blah. So the point we're talking about here is, um, you know, as former county clerk, I might get a contribution above the 750 limit. Okay, it's, it, right now the law is $750 from someone who does business with Cook County. And I would know all the vendors out there. So if I got a contribution for $1,000, the Board of Ethics job would be to say, hey, Mr. Orr, you got 250 more than legally allowable. You need to return the money. And of course, I'd return the money because there's no way you can know about all of these quote vendors. That's the job that the Board of Ethics does. Um, but if I understand it right, then Berrios finally was forced to pay this fine, even though he said he shouldn't have had to been covered by this law. Uh, the Board of Review, if I understand it right, got in the same problem. They were doing the same thing. And that's what you referred to before. Okay. And just because I don't want to forget it later, I want everyone to know who supports, I guess, our view of campaign finance reform is there's a move right now in Cook County to raise that limit of 750 to $1,500, so twice as much. Um, now it may not be a lot of money in a lot of people's minds. The key question, I think, for reformers is whether or not when people feel, as we've certainly seen in our history of Chicago and Cook, that if, if you don't give the money, are you not gonna get the service that quote, you deserve? So uh, how appropriate, number one, is it that Board of Review people take that money, even the 750, and two, do you think the county should be raising that, making it even more pressure on um, vendors and so forth to have to penny up, so to speak? Uh, are you asking me? I'm asking you and anybody else. Any, uh, all of our panelists can respond, but you're the ethics are. Well, well may I jump in and ask what, sure, what is the rationale that's being used in that case for, for, for doubling the, the only uh, rationale was um, that it's confusing for elected officials to realize that for three straight years, you can only take 750 and an election year, you can take 750 both in the primary and the general. Now, if that's confusing to people, that ain't nothing. They I'm shouldn't sorry. be in elected office if that confuses them. Okay, well, um, I, I would have to agree with you, Naomi. Um, so what about the appropriateness of taking that money, uh, uh, Juliet? We know that um, Assessor Kagi vowed that he would not take money from the property tax uh, lawyers and others who do business with his office. Uh, do you think by law or just by habit, they should do the same thing at the Board of Review? Oh. A, few, a few points. First, uh... I agree strongly with Naomi that a low cap uh, is correct for the public policy that it serves, which is to say to minimize the influence of money in politics 
coming from donors who have active pending matters before elected officials who can exercise their discretion in favor of those donors. It's either an actual conflict or at the very least an appearance of conflict if big money comes from those donors to those elected officials. Um, with regard to the policies that have been implemented by Assessor Kagi within his own office, I admire them. I, I am also mindful to be fair, David, that uh, fundraising is a reality in political campaigns and candidates have to do it. Uh, I, I, I believe that Assessor Kagi has financial means and was able to finance his own campaign to a significant extent the last time around. Not everybody uh, may be able to run a successful campaign um, and say, I'm not going to take uh, uh, money from, uh, from property tax lawyers whatsoever. Um, but I do believe that, um, that setting the limit is, uh, is important. And I also reject the notion that it's too confusing for somebody who's smart enough to get themselves elected to public office to have to abide by it every three years. Okay, um, uh, David, before we uh, move on, uh, are there other issues um, that, like remember the IG has been um, attacking, so to speak, or politely attacking the Board of Review for several years on the patronage office. In other words, that they didn't have really civil service protections, political mm -hmm. hiring, political firing. Um, now that particularly when you see the FBI alleged bribery um, is that a problem? Being a political office, uh, as opposed to most of the other offices that have to follow Shackman or rules of civil service. So I'll only speak briefly to the FBI investigation about which like everybody else, I only know what I've read in the papers, um, which is to say there is, <clears throat> uh, an, uh, there is an employee at the board of review uh, who is supposed to have uh, to have been taking money in exchange for favorable rulings by the Board of Review. That employee does not appear to be a member of the Board of Review, but rather an employee of that office. And that employee is supposed to have said that they are just the middle person. Um, to me, that seems credible. I say that as a former federal prosecutor who did prosecute bribery in the city of Chicago Department of Buildings and Zoning. Uh, the ultimate decision maker has to be reached somehow. Uh, decision makers, of course, are the members of the Board of Review. Low level employees don't have the authority to make those decisions that directly affect property owners who are seeking review of their valuations. Um, so I surmise that the FBI investigation is ongoing and that that one employee may only be the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, I, I would expect as well. Uh, again, people feel free to jump in. We're going to... Yeah, before we... I, I do want to just make a, a couple of comments with respect to the appeals process. Um, this is something that I've studied and I'm, I, with a group of my students, work with the, the Tribune reporter, uh, Jason Grotto, on these analyses. And so just, <clears throat> first of all, I think somebody already mentioned, for those of you who are homeowners interested in this topic, you don't need a lawyer, you, you, can, you can appeal to, directly. And so that's an important uh, thing to be aware of if you're in that situation. Um, you know, what we found is that, it, first of all, people who had a lawyer didn't necessarily, were not more likely to get a reduction than, than people that didn't. And so that also should be encouraging to you if you're thinking about appealing on your own. Secondly, it seems to me that the, the nature of this is such that What's really going on is just a system, and I think this is what a point Juliet was emphasizing, it's systemic. It's just a system of transferring you know, money from homeowners to lawyers. And the, the way it effectively works is, is most of the lawyers who are in this business work on some kind of a contingency in which they will take a percentage of the reduction that they get for you. Uh, and that, that percentage varies a surprisingly large amount <laughs> based on, on, on what I've seen, but somewhere between 20 to even up as much as 50% of the reduction you get will go, will go to the lawyer who represented you. Um, and so I think somebody asked, how much money is this? Well, this is a massive amount of money because it's, 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 it's quite a lot of money in, in reductions that are going out. It's definitely in the tens of millions, if not more. 
Uh, but the, the real thing that goes on is, is virtually all the appeals are granted. In other words, if you appeal based on our analysis, you have about an 80% likelihood of getting a reduction. Okay? The amount of your reduction may vary. And maybe you know, the people who were, who were paying off this, this employee wanted a bigger reduction than what they got. But the fact of the matter is, if you appeal, you've got an 80% probability of getting a reduction. And that's true even if you were underassessed to begin with. And I want to emphasize that. Now, how does this system perpetuate itself? Even the people who are underassessed to begin with, the people that own the most valuable homes, who are most likely to appeal in the first place, they get reductions too. Uh, and so if you're about an 80% probability of getting a reduction, essentially what that is, is just mean if you're willing to write a check to your lawyer for a third or uh, up to half of what you're going to get, you're going to get a reduction. Uh, and that's to me, the nature of, of the system. And it, it, we did not find that it really matters which lawyer was represented, uh, was representing you. And I, I hear it often say, oh, you have to have this connected lawyer or this or that. That's not what we found. And partly it's just because because the odds are already so high that you're going to get a reduction, having a well, I mean, if you have a baseline probability of 80% getting a reduction, how much more can your connected lawyer do? Um, Chris, can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. How did you all measure degree of connectedness? We just looked at whether there was any variation across the law firms. Got it. And so not to get into statistics here, but if you put in just fixed effects for the law firm representing you, you can ask whether some law firms stand out as being particularly effective. Um, and they really don't. Um, and then we did know some particular firms who are just notorious and, you know, for their Burke and, and, and Madigan, for example. Um, and so we, we just didn't find it that, that there was any, you know, particular class of firms that stood out above the others. But again, that's just because already there's an 80% chance for me to be do much better than 80%, I, you know, that's, so anyway, uh, that's kind of the nature of the appeal system. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is the appeals do make the inequities worse for, for sure, but we see that the inequities are already there in the assessments to begin with, okay? People who own the most expensive homes are already underassessed. And the people who own the lowest value homes are already overassessed. And after the appeals, those people with the most valuable homes get it even lower, but the inequity was, was already, the, the appeals are not the cause of it, but they do exacerbate the problem. Uh, hopefully one of the things that we'll explore as, as we continue this series is kind of the tougher and perhaps you'd call it a political question is to what extent are the things we're talking about an intentional design? You know, I spent 40 years in uh, politics in Chicago and uh, these things are designed in my experience. Ed Burke as finance chairman represented every major corporation in Chicago, a little exaggerated, but United Airlines, I could go on. Uh, clearly the conflicts of interest were enormous. They still are. Uh, and I would suggest that that's something we need to try and figure out if this is just kind of accidental or it was all a plan. Uh, let's jump to one other thing uh, relating to it, and anybody can um, help out here. Um, back to the equity issue and the whole thing about assessments, which it can have an effect on your property taxes. Now. Some of the data that we're collecting, for example, suggest uh, last year in the South Triennial, because they do it in sections, okay, um, the board, in this case, the Board of Review, reduced homeowners' assessments by 93 million, okay, which is 1% of that. But they reduced commercial by over 1 billion, or 23.4%. Um, and there's other similar findings like that. Now remember uh, that, that those people that got the homeowner reductions, as Chris said, you're probably happy whether they were fully deserved or not. But if you're also giving enormous commercial breaks, um, that means someone else has to pay for it. And just one example because of time that we'd like to get some answers for. Um, there's a property in Oak Park, 270 unit multifamily building uh, in 2020, the first pass of the value roughly was 98 million. They came in asking for an appeal. They wanted 81 million. Uh, the assessor's office gave them 90 million. They recall a compromise. Okay. Um, however, when it went to the hearing with the board of review, it was raised down to 43.5 million. Okay. From uh, the assessor had it at 90 million to 43.5 million. Uh, so the real challenge for us and to understand, uh, there's a lot of things now you can see in the assessor's office 
uh, studies. You can see how they do their things and um, evaluations. Uh, I think we'd all like to know what was the basis for giving this kind of break. And we could go into others if we had time. Um, any comments on that? I know this is in the weeds a little bit, but this is the heart of it. Because if, if in fact, uh, um, these numbers that we've been researching are true, we're talking about, I think what Chris said earlier, and what Naomi said, shifting enormous hundreds of millions of dollars from commercials that should be paying to homeowners that may or may not be able to afford it. If anybody wants to jump in on that. Julia, do you, do you have a, any, any I, know, I know you know the Board of Review, do you have any insights? I, I have a couple of thoughts, but I think- No, might, please, Chris, go for out. it. Um, okay, so, so I don't know that particular property, so I'm not gonna be able to say, you know, what happened there. It does seem particularly bizarre that they would reduce the valuation even lower than the, the amount that was requested by the owner. I heard you say they asked for 80 something million and got 43. That's a pretty, pretty good negotiation. Um, you know, what I have heard and have been told by, you know, one of the commissioners uh, is that at least under Barrios, they on the board of review felt a bit uh, mismatched in terms of the cases. In other words, they only saw one side. The person appealing the property taxes would come and provide evidence and make a case. And at least under Barrios, nobody from the assessor's office would show up to argue the other side. So they said they felt like a judge that was only hearing one side uh, of the evidence. And you know what were they what were they going to do? So I, I'm kind of paraphrasing what what this commissioner told me, and I, I I can't independently validate that that's true. But but I my sense is it is true that the assessor was just not defending. Uh, the assessor's office was not defending its valuations in these kind of hearings, and that that makes a pretty uneven matchup. My sense also is that under Kagi, they are defending them now. They are devoting, you know, it does take, uh, you know, it takes time away from the office to send your people to these hearings and, and uh, defend the hearings, and my sense is they're doing that. So I would expect to see less of this now than in the past, but again, we'll see when we get the data. It clearly hasn't ended and I think, David, your question about uh, why is it so much more in reductions coming to the commercial side? I mean, one is there's, they're more likely to appeal because there's so much money at, at stake and they probably already have lawyers. But two, their assessments are going up much more to begin with. So I think there's more, there's bigger increases coming from the new regime. And so there are more opportunities to reduce those also. That would be my, my guess, but I don't know that particular case. Okay, let's try and get to a few other questions in our remaining time. We're gonna try going to 8.15 for all you are watching. Our guests are willing to, to go a little longer. Um, a, a question from uh, Stephanie Victor, okay. Um, what compensation does a property owner have for uh, assessment mistakes uh, for not updating property? <laughs> Could you read the question one more time? I'm sorry. It's, it's, what um, compensation does a property owner have for assessor mistakes or assessment mistakes uh, in not updating proper property information? One thing I know that you discovered, um, uh, Chris, in, in a various regime is that there are many times where they went years and just didn't do the work. They didn't reassess property. It might have stayed the same for several years. Uh, yeah. Let's Let's say there was a mistake made. Um, so my, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so Juliet can correct me if I, if I get this wrong, but my understanding, because I have seen uh, folks try to lit litigate this, at least in, in a couple other cities, is that the, their view is that you have this opportunity to appeal, and so the system has provided you a way to get a remedy, and if you, if you didn't appeal, then you essentially have lost your right to recover whatever you lost so to be compensated for this. And so the appeal window is actually pretty short. It's a matter of, I forget if it's 60 or 90 days, but it's not very long. And if you don't appeal during that window, I, my sense is legally the, the decision has been that you cannot therefore come back after that time has passed and claim that you were mistreated and ask for compensation, that you're expected to have done that to the system. We also have several questions. Oh, I think Juliet was, uh, I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to add that that is correct. And that's why the current office of the assessor is um, is urging homeowners 
because they're currently assessing residential properties within the city of Chicago, um, to provide all relevant uh, information now during the assessment period, um, because uh, after the assessment has passed and the review process has passed, it's extremely difficult and nigh on impossible to undo or get a, a, an after the fact reduction. Okay, we had several questions asking about, do we have too many uh, layers of government here? We haven't even touched another one. As, as me, people may know, at least in Cook County, you can come to the assessor's office and appeal. Then you go to the board of review. In some cases you go to court, but there's also something called PTAB and that's the property tax appeals at the state level. Uh, we will have another our next session. We'll get into that much more. But the questions, um, the general question is, yeah, there, is there any evidence to suggest by having several options, does that provide more equity for Illinois residents or does it work against the equity? I say that um, the average um, homeowner in the black community taxed with, with so many issues uh, of, of burning concern will not, not have in their background, will not have in the community conversation, will not have at the dinner table or at their accountant's office, a conversation uh, about, uh, about appeals, about fairness, about valuation, um, about options, there is a sort of a blanket um, of, you know, failure to communicate, um, a lack of depth of engagement. Uh, one of the things that we're working on in our sustainable square mile of West Woodlawn um, is how to proactively lift up these what you could call arcane issues. They're they're hardcore. They're uh, they're practical. They're impactful, but they're you know they're beyond the pale in in, in that and the regards of the normal everyday average practice of a household. We have to we have to flip that script uh, until there comes a time when um, the uh, systemic abuses that were noted here are no longer in effect, we have to, uh, some of us who are committed to equity have to look at what we can do um, on a practical and tactical level in our neighborhoods. So we understand that, uh, for example, Assessor Kagi is willing and able, others from his office are able to come out and do uh, a Zoom or a program in our communities. It's, you know, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, but it's not gonna turn the tide of our inability to um, file our own appeals, even make sure that our exemptions are claimed. And so uh, what we're doing is we're looking um, at the data of our community. We're looking at um, who owns the properties. Um, we're looking at who's living there. We're we're building a database uh, of contact information where we can reach out household to household and begin to have these conversations. We do door-to-door -door communications. We live and work in the same neighborhood. It's extremely labor intensive. Um, and in, in point of fact, there ought to be um, county funds made available uh, to those of us who are, are working uh, at the case level in our neighborhoods to try to, to, try to uh, create more household income through savings on um, these un unfair assessments. So I think on the one hand, yes, this reform is absolutely needed. The legislation is absolutely needed. But what, what can the county do? We understand the injustice is happening here and now. What can the county do 
to, uh, to, to demonstrate its awareness that it is failing a key constituency, um, you know, a rightful beneficiary of equity um, and consistently failing us. You can't just know that there's a problem and keep not doing anything about it uh, at the impact level. So if there is not going to in fact be uh, more true assessments and some system of returning funds to those who have been unfairly taxed, then however you want to realign or reallocate county money, there ought to be money for um, deep, deep tissue education, engagement, and ways to walk people through, hold people's hand, do workshops, and get their taxes uh, reduced, their assessments reduced. Can't have it both ways. I think you're, you're Naomi, you, you point to the importance of having other elected officials be behind this as well. And this can't just be the assessor, Fritz Kage, a one person uh, effort. No. Here. And I'm, you know, to be frank, we haven't really seen that from a lot of other elected officials, uh, a few exceptions. <laughs> but, you know, if you want to look at the Cook County Board, who, who's, who's Kegi's big backer on the Cook County Board? Who, who is behind this? Because the assessor can't rectify all of this, uh, even if he can get the assessments right, and let's hope he does, this matter of, of, of compensation, this matter of, of making up for you know, this historical damage, that's not something the assessor can do. And it is, I think, a bit disappointing to, that the lack of leadership that we've seen you know, on, the, on the county board from the mayor, uh, really- And state kind of legislators. From, from the state at, at, at all levels. I mean, we can, this, can't, this isn't just a one, a one person show, or at least it, it shouldn't be, and it won't work if it is. Campaign well, finance reform is another important part of this whole process because we've talked about what it means to run for office and what it costs to run for office. Um, there, there, there are examples in other places in the world and other places in the country where we, uh, where we can see that um, the influence of money is, um, is buffered from uh, the process of being elected to office. If we're not gonna have campaign finance reform, there are just certain things that are never gonna happen. We, I, you know, Blacks and Green does a ton of work in the energy realm and the influence uh, of, of uh, fossil fuel dollars, for example, uh, over legislators is un, it's excruciating. So, you know, where there, where there is an opportunity for money to buy its impact, it will buy its impact. Absolutely. And that's something that- uh, Reform for but, Illinois agrees yeah, with you 100%, Naomi. So remember, so some of these, because, you know, we're having a three-part series, some of the things we can follow up a little bit more in the future, but before we sum up, since we just mentioned we had several questions, uh, Priscilla Mims had asked about um, PTAB, just so people know, remember that's, that's the state level thing. Uh, the governor appoints five commissioners who run that. Uh, there's some people that think it's very good, others that have questions. You might have seen that Fritz Kage and um, former, former minority, uh, well, actually majority leader in the house, Barbara Flynn Curry, had uh, wrote an article um, basically attacking PTAB, I feel it was useful in Cook County. Just real quickly on that, PTAB's been around for a while, but it was not really applied to Cook County and still starting about 1997 with legislation that was pushed through in 1995. I have theories on that, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, kind of a, a new help the lawyers uh, legislation. Uh, so that has been applied. It has all sorts of problems. It has some good people that work there and we might hear from one of them soon. Um, but it made a lot of news recently because PTAB gave President Trump a uh, million dollars for a several year old battle that, that they've been having. Um, and one of the key things that we'd like to understand and we can't go into because of time is that PTAB was now saying 
the reason, part of the reason I had to rule for Trump, and Burke had been his lawyer, keep in mind, um, and this is one of the many tax uh, issues that the Trump people have uh, with PTAB, but they said part of the reason they had to go ahead and give him that reward, more or less, because the Board of Review had not presented evidence. Uh, and the Board of Review is, um, uh, you know, overwhelmed in many cases because of pandemic and other things. And so there's lots of cases like that where they're not presenting evidence. Without that, it allegedly ties the hands of PTAB. We'll try and get more information from you in the future. Um, so having said that, let's just wrap it up. Let's give our, our three wonderful guests a chance. Um, we are not going to, we are going to be discussing in the future things that people can do. Okay. There's an ethics ordinance they can push for. There's a campaign finance stuff we've talked about. Um, as Chris said, we can certainly encourage the commissioners to step on this stuff. Um, you know, should the Board of Review be allowed to be a political office and hire politically, uh, unlike most other places uh, now in the county. So we'll have a, a list for you of all sorts of things that people can lobby for. So having said that, David, before, yes, go ahead. You, yeah. like, before you, mm -hmm. before we wrap up, I just want to ask a question that I think is a really good, important question from Cynthia. Um, and I think it refers to something that Chris said. Uh, when you say that under the new assessor, the process has improved, but it remains to be seen whether it will lead to better outcomes. What outcomes are you talking about? What would success look like here? Uh, success would look like fair assessments, meaning the valuation for people who own the lowest priced homes and the highest priced homes is equal, meaning equal as a proportion of the value. So they sh you're supposed to be 10, your, your assessed value is supposed to be 10% of your market value and success looks like 10% on average for everybody, uh, regardless of the value of their home. Now, the assessments are not going to be perfect. It's not going to be exactly 10% for everybody. We know there will be mistakes, but those mistakes should not be systematically correlated with the value of your home. Otherwise, they're not mistakes. Uh, so that, that's to me what success looks like and, and rebalancing uh, commercial and, uh, and residential properties in proportion to their true value in the market. That is success. And by the way, <laughs> you would love to see the appeals really be eliminated under a system like that. Somebody asked, some, one of the questions was, if we had accurate assessments, would we need all these appeals? Well, we certainly wouldn't need them. We don't need them now. Uh, it's not a matter of need, uh, but we would like to get rid of them. The fact is people are people are appealing now who are already underassessed, asking to be lowered. People who are appealing now who have already accurate assessments asking. For, so the accuracy of assessment is not the cause of the appeal, but you somehow we've got to get to a system where the, the, the values are basically fair and most people don't appeal. And the truth of the matter is that's how other jurisdictions work. I don't know what, what it is about the history of Cook County that has got us to this equilibrium, but New York, San Francisco, pick your other ma major city, they have a tiny fraction of the number of appeals we have. And then those systems, people actually appeal when there is in fact a problem with their assessment. Uh, we need that, that, and that would be a mark of success. Again, Keggy can't do that uh, all on his own, that part. The assessments, the first two criteria I listed, that's on his office to do and get right, but it takes more. A good point. Other people have less problems than we do in the assessing of property. Let's give uh, Juliet, Naomi, uh, last comments, and then we'll uh, let everybody have dinner or something. <laughs> well, I, I really like what Chris was saying um, to just clarify um, you know, what is the purpose of the assessment? However it began, however long it was perpetuated, uh, whatever uh, the, uh, the sources are that are supporting it now, how do we end it? You know, who's going to take that up? Who's going to fight that battle? Who's going to win that battle to eliminate, just, just eliminate the appeals process? I mean, why aren't we doing that? Can, who can tell me? Well, uh, because of time, I, I, think, <laughs> I, think I, I think we know this. Well, I'll put it this way. Anybody who wants to work on the issue of eliminating appeals, let's talk. Okay. But just keep, keep in mind that assessor's office, without not considering all these things, that there's going to be mistakes made in a, with this you know, so many properties. So the but question, that, yeah, but the mistakes are not the problem. 
So I'll, I'll pick up there um, and I'll also respond to Paul's question in the chat. I, I do think it begins with the assessor's office, although it doesn't end there. Uh, getting the valuations right after they have been wrong and systemically reinforced for so long, not only is it a big job, but it's, it's an unpopular job, right? Um, so, uh, so ultimately where it ends is the voting booth. Uh, we choose who we put in these offices uh, and their commitment to a fiduciary obligation to the public, whether it's valuing taxes, whether it is high ethical standards. Uh, I would also second what David said a moment ago about the uh, amendments to the Cook County Ethics Ordinance, which were introduced by Commissioner Sufferton, who's now not seeking re-election. I, I sincerely hope they don't die on the vine because they would result in a more rigorous ethical standard for both elected officials and employees in Cook County. If I, I just want to add one optimistic note to build on what both you and Naomi said, which is, it, you know, as, as easy it is to get discouraged about so many things in Cook County, the one thing I, I always remember is, you know, when, when Keggy ran against Berrios, and at the beginning, and really nobody thought he was going to win, uh, but when Keggy ran against Berrios, I was very curious to see how the different parts of the city were going to vote, because it was very clear which parts of the city were paying too little in taxes, and essentially, Keggy was running on a platform and said, hey, everybody on the north side, I'm going to raise your taxes. <laughs> And guess what? The North Side voted for Kagi in overwhelming margins, more so than lots of other parts of the city, to be honest. So these were people who were willing to vote. To, effectively, they're voting to raise their own taxes knowingly to get the system right and to bring fairness to it. And I hope that those same people will stick by Kagi as he actually does it and they actually you know, begin to kind of feel that bite in the pocketbook, because I think that is one of the most optimistic and encouraging things about Cook County that I've seen in a long time is the way the whole county got behind this reform, even the people who would essentially end up paying, paying more to fix it. Okay, we wanna thank you uh, all very much. Uh, Naomi, Juliet, Chris, um, you all did an outstanding job. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, as we said earlier, uh, there's going to be uh, two more parts to this series. Lots to talk about. Alicia? Thank you, everybody, so much. We all learned a lot. I learned a lot, um, and hopefully you'll join us for the next, uh, the next session. Thank, thank you, you. Alicia. And, thank you, Elisa and David. Thank you, Juliet, Naomi, and Chris. And thank you to Reform for Illinois for co-hosting tonight. Uh, and thank you to everyone who spent your evening with us tonight learning about this. Uh, a recording of this virtual town hall is now on Good Government Illinois' Facebook page. So if you missed the beginning, you can check it out. Uh, as David and Elisa mentioned, this is the first in a series on this topic. So keep an eye out for our upcoming announcements for the next virtual town hall, co-hosted by Good Government Illinois and Reform for Illinois. And finally, events like these are only possible with your support. Please visit Good Government Illinois to chip in so we can keep holding our virtual town halls. And again, we are hoping to get back to in-person events uh, when it is safe to do so. Thank you all again and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.